one of the speakers at the 1981 National Farmers Organization dairy commodity meetings at the National Convention in Indianapolis, Indiana, was Gary Rohde, Dean of the University of Wisconsin, River Falls, Wisconsin, also former Secretary of Agriculture in Wisconsin, who is now being introduced by Dairy Director Al Scott. I got my own, looks like I got my own uh, cheerleading section or whatever. Uh, I think, do you want me to give her a little report on right now or, uh, or just introduce Gary? Okay. Uh, no. Yeah, well, I, I, I wouldn't want to do that now and, and uh, get everybody diverted from what you want to say, Gary. So I think maybe we, but I want to, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker and uh, pardon me for uh, using some notes here because he has uh, quite a uh, long list of accomplishments and uh, it presently uh, Dr. Rohde, who is going to be our speaker, is the Dean of the College of Agriculture at uh, University of Wisconsin at River Falls. Uh, just. He's just been the past Secretary of Agriculture in the state of Wisconsin, and I'd like to say that uh, our organization have worked very closely with Gary's administration and his people in the Department of Agriculture and had some differences of opinion at times, but generally speaking, we were pretty much in accord, and I think that he represented uh, all farmers in the state of Wisconsin well as Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, Gary's got a, uh, a, some educational background behind him. He's got a BS, uh, Bachelor of Science, de Science degree from the Wisconsin State University, River Falls, with major, majoring in agricultural education. He's got an MS from University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, major in agricultural economics, and a PhD from University of Wisconsin-Madison, major in agricultural economics. He, uh, some of the things, he's been selected as a member of Outstanding Educators of America from University of Wisconsin-River Falls in 1970. He's been a recipient of the Distinguished Teacher Award on the University of uh, River Falls campus from 74 and 75. Uh, leader of trade missions during his tenure as Secretary of Agriculture to Japan, uh, representing 12 Midwestern states. He's Chairman of Marketing and Agricultural Development and the Committee for, of the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture uh, in, from 1978 to 1980. Uh, he was representative from Wisconsin at Taiwan Trade Investment Forum in 1979. He's uh, president of the Midwest Association of State Departments of Agriculture, 1980-81. So he does have a long list of accomplishments. We hope that through his, in his present position, that we can continue uh, cooperation with the university system in, in uh, agriculture and uh, I look forward to a long and continuing uh, association with the university and with uh, Dr. Rohde. So why don't we give uh, Dr. Rohde a real uh, welcome here as the guest speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Steve, and I feel very honored to have been invited to address you this, uh, this fine day here in Indianapolis. There's less snow here than there is in northern Wisconsin, I can assure you, and it's kind of nice to come south, as perhaps some of you uh, from Wisconsin and other ver areas in the northern part of the United States uh, would share that sort of, uh, that short of, sort of thing with me. I very much appreciate the opportunity to come and to talk about the dairy industry, to talk about agriculture. It's my life. 
would spend my lifeblood over the, all my years, born and raised on a farm, have a brother that's two, youngers, two years younger than I that's uh, attempting to make ends meet on a dairy farm, a typical kind of a dairy farm in central Wisconsin, and we uh, checked pretty closely with him and with many others who were in the dairy business in the state of Wisconsin. I want to acknowledge uh, the excellent working relationship for nearly six years that I had with the state National Farm Organization, with Steve Pavich, uh, John Gasser, uh, Jim Ziegweed, I see Ken Schmidt, in fact, a couple of these individuals with our Board of Agriculture in the state of Wisconsin served as at least part of my employer or my boss in the state of Wisconsin. So I appreciate the opportunity of having developed a good, close, personal working relationship with the organization and with a number of people. And Steve, we had a kind of an agreement that every other year I would come to the state NFO convention and Wisconsin and uh, would be happy to spend 20 minutes or a half an hour uh, speaking before the group, but I would be there every year to talk with various members uh, who were part of the state organization and very much appreciated the opportunity for that kind of a discussion that's so important for those of us who were in policy making decisions and who still are involved in agricultural education or helping to form the agricultural issues and articulate them for the days both today as well as in the future. I think it would be useful before I launch into the dairy industry situation that I was asked to make some comments on to represent for you a little bit of my philosophy regarding agriculture and what I see as some very crucial and very important aspects of agriculture that you and your organization have identified with, but that I would like to lay in front of you and say that I very strongly believe in and that I've worked hard in the last six years to bring them before the people in the state of Wisconsin and to deal with them in a responsible manner and to point out and to come forth with some constructive kinds of programs and activities on behalf of agriculture that I think are so very important, some of which we take for granted and some of which we lose in this fast-paced shuffle of ours on the farm, in the city, in state legislatures or wherever. My roots from the standpoint of philosophy are embodied from an agricultural standpoint in, number one, the absolute importance of preserving a family farm operation of agriculture an owner-operator system of agriculture that I fear we're losing faster than we ought to be and that I know your organization stands squarely behind that kind of a concept. And as I've traveled the world, I believe increasingly that that's what's made our agriculture great to a large degree is a work ethic, is an element of security, is an element of individual freedom that our farmers possess by being able to own and control and become somewhat individualistic as far as their farm operations are concerned, an owner-operator system of agriculture. I strongly believe that that's what's missing in other parts of the world as I travel the world and look at why food isn't being produced. We're lacking a man, land, or people land relationship that is embodied in the citizens and the people of this country. I think that's a very important objective to work hard for. Secondly, I think increasingly the citizens of our state, I hope as a result of my 100 talks a year around the state, further believe in a land preservation ethic, that we must preserve our land for agricultural purposes that we must put a higher emphasis on soil and water conservation and in fact come forth and convince urban people that there is and there needs to be a very clear right to farm established and that land must be preserved. In Wisconsin we have lost land at the rate at the rate over the last 25 years in agriculture so that if that were to continue 
A hundred years from now, we wouldn't have any land and agriculture. We can't continue to lose at that kind of a rate. I believe a soil, water, and farmland preservation ethic is a second very important keystone from an agricultural standpoint. A third one is market information. Marketing and market information. Market news, direct marketing, market orders, bargaining attempts, those kinds of marketing alternatives that are available are very important. And I worked hard to make sure that information increasingly was available, particularly to farmers, to make decisions, to make marketing decisions, and to have that information and to have marketing alternatives and good marketing outlets. That is important, and that's much, that has much to do with what you as an organization are obviously involved in and will continue to be involved in as we project ahead. I guess a fourth thing would be market development. Selling and actually creating better markets for our products. Working on the aspect of demand. Making sure that if something isn't cheese, it ought not to be labeled as cheese. Making sure that we have the kind of monies available for new product development. And if 60 to 70 percent of the people in the world cannot consume milk because they can't assimilate it in their body, we ought to be working on the research to make sure that those individuals with additives into that milk can use nature's most perfect food. And we need to spend more dollars and we need to work on this so that we can develop the kind of markets for milk and that milk can be used. And then finally, been very much interested in the whole question of income policy for farmers. Yes, a dairy price support program has occupied as much of my time in the last six years as any other single program and activity. And I don't believe you pull the pins out of dairy farmers relative to dairy price support programs. Target prices and loan prices and various kinds of prices like this are important. And I look at farmers and individuals who have gotten in in the last four or five years, and those that are highly leveraged, and those that have a cash flow problem, and those that are paying 20% interest are having very, very difficult times. And it seems to me we need to be working with them and not put a large number of individuals through a very, very serious economic ringer, as I call it, and what I see happening. And in fact, what I'm projecting, I guess, as we look into the next year or two. Those areas represent a philosophical base and a root of philosophy from whence I come in operating and conducting the activities of an agriculture department on behalf of 94,000 farmers in the state of Wisconsin, with 45,000 of those being dairy farmers, with $3 billion of the income of that $4.7 billion that farmers get in Wisconsin, $3 billion of it coming as a result of the sale of milk and dairy products in the state of Wisconsin. And the interest is fantastic from the standpoint of dairy, the dairy industry, dairy programs, dairy marketing efforts. And it should be, and rightfully so, when we look at the farmers and the businesses that have their lives staked and their investments in that kind of a, in that kind of a farm activity and enterprise selection activity that we have. Now what's happening? Farmers are getting larger. They are more, they're fewer. They're more highly specialized. Forty years ago, we had 193,000 farms in the state of Wisconsin. Today we have 93,000. That's quite a drop when we look at the concept of the individual owner operators out there on the land. I guess the other thing that I look at this past year, and we go back to February and March and April, I really think the dairy industry has, maybe it's a question of timing, but it has been singled out for a fairly massive reduction in income. In fact, the, re the income that's going to be foregone by the dairy industry in the state of Wisconsin as a result of not having price adjustments in the year 1980 under the Dairy Price Support Program will amount to $600 million for our 45,000 farmers this year. I guess I ask myself, here we have a very productive sector 
of our economy. They're very efficient, they're hard working, and they're being asked to bear a very heavy load. I think a disproportionately too heavy a load as we look at where we are this year relative to the Farm Bill and various government pieces of legislation. In fact, I will suggest that the fact that we're not getting an increase and with what's happening with other commodity prices, that the drop in support prices are going to result and going to cause more production of milk in the, sh in the short run. I see more production this year in the first part of 1982 as I gaze ahead in looking at what's happening as far as the dairy industry is concerned. And I see a pretty high price in human and economic terms, particularly from young farmers, and particularly what's going to happen this winter as a result of the net income figures that I'm looking at and that I'm hearing from some of the dairy farmers in Wisconsin. And I'm particularly concerned, I guess, as we relate this back to who is going to be our next generation of farmers. As we look at the young people that need to come in that will be replacing the average age of the dairyman in Wisconsin, which is 53 or 54 years old, in the next 10 years. And that we do have the difficulty and the problem and the challenge of hopefully targeting or saying, yes, our next generation of farmers ought to be owners and operators, and they ought to be the individuals out there that are going to be producing rather than the absentee landlord, rather than the amount of money or the large amount of money coming from the non-farm sector that's likely to flow. Now given those observations, in the dairy industry you and I know that the figures are not real pleasant right now. Let me give you just a few quick ones. In October of this year we are milking 80,000 more cows than we were a year ago. We're milking 11,000 more in Wisconsin. And that's the first time that's happened for a number of years. Our milk production in October was up 3% from a year ago, and it's 7% up from two years ago. In Wisconsin, it was 1% and 3%. In fact, Arizona, California, and various other states other than America's Dairyland are increasing milk production faster than Wisconsin have over the last couple of years. Looks like they will for the next year or two. 31 of 33 states, 31 of 33 states in October reported their October milk production greater than a year ago as we look at production figures. And in fact, October was the 30th consecutive month of greater production than the previous month. USDA purchases 12.5 billion pounds of milk on an equivalent basis last year, 8 to 9 percent. So as we look at the concept of supply, the amount of money that's involved there, and as we look at the amount of milk that is produced, we see that it is greater than what is being taken off the market at the present time. Now this creates a problem because milk prices have not gone up while well, the costs of production have and will continue to. And as I look at the amount of milk and as I look at the things that are in place now, this fall, through this winter and into 82, it looks to me like milk production will continue at high levels through 1982. Why do I say this? I say it because I see low cull cow prices and the incentive is not there to cull. I say it because there are a record number of replacement heifers based upon the statistics I've just looked at to move into the milk line nationally and we've had a bumper crop of hay, corn, soybeans and feed and those prices are low, too low and dairy farmers aren't about at this point to go into corn production or turkey production or for that matter, just about anything, because those prices are not very attractive. So those production levels projecting into 1982 look to me 
for those reasons, like they're going to continue to be large. Now what about the cost of producing milk? Some interesting figures. What's happened in 1978? USDA figure, $10.57 to produce 100 pounds of milk. 1979, $12.21 USDA figures. 1980, $13.07. Don't know what the 1981 figures are going to be, but I know this. That in looking at those past three years and looking at this year, the cost of producing milk has been going up and will probably go up about a dollar a hundredweight. That's what's happening. There's been no increase in price this past year, none projected this next year. We're finding an increase of about a dollar a hundredweight in the cost of producing milk. That's going to create increasingly a cost price squeeze as far as the individual dairy farmer those 45,000 dairy farms in Wisconsin. The squeeze is going to increase. It's going to tighten as we look ahead. The other observation I make about the cost of producing milk is that it's kind of all over the map. Depending upon the debt load, depending upon the price of land that's factored in, who may have bought some land in the last five years, whether you have the feed there, what kind of condition your land was in, a whole series of factors can bring about a cost of production. As I ask individual farmers, what's your cost of producing milk? I get some figures that vary all over the lot, going all the way from $7 a hundredweight up to $18 or $20 a hundredweight. And I've asked that question many times of many farmers. So when we ask, say, what, what is the average cost of producing milk? It's very difficult. And who's average? There may not, it may be difficult to find someone that's average. Given this, and I've had a series of letters and individual farmers saying to me, what should I do? Dairy farmers. My advice to them right now in the short run is good, careful, sound management is awfully important. Let's not make the kind of expenditures in capital and equipment that you might normally want to make. That's awfully important. And we've had the biggest silo building boom in Wisconsin in the last five years of any five-year period that I've ever seen. And that, I don't know if that's true in other states, but it's true in Wisconsin. And we have had a fair amount of money put into storage facilities and storage units, much of which can be well justified, but those kinds of purchase need, purchases need to be delayed. As I talk to implement dealers, that's precisely what farmers are doing. They're not selling tractors and implements based upon the implement dealers that I've been talking to over the last six to eight months. If farmers think they have it tough, implement dealers tell me that it's even tougher. And the bottom line for international harvester probably suggests that if you've been following their stock price and what they're doing right now <clears throat> as far as a large manufacturer. And I see Alice Chalmers now closing a plant this week as well and laying off a couple thousand workers. Sound careful management. I would say to an individual farmer, don't increase your cows online. Do a better job with what you have. And many farmers are doing that. And that as a group, we cannot continue to outproduce what we can sell, what we can move, what we can handle. And we have that difficulty at the present time. And I would say third, we need to get behind various kinds of selling efforts in trying to expand demand. And yes, bargaining efforts and contracting, the, some of the kinds of things that I see your organization doing and others, and I think doing quite well. Now to step back from the individual farmer, what about the dairy industry in total? 
what about the dairy industry from a policy standpoint as to what's going on and what are the kinds of things we need to hang tough with as far as the dairy industry is concerned? And let me take two aspects of this. Let me start out by saying we've got the demand side. And I have some interest there, and I think you should have some interest there, in doing more to create a demand for our product dairying and the many fine products that we produce. I don't think we've built the kind of a demand for dairy products and milk that we can or that we should. Now let me give you some illustrations. I observe, for example, the per capita consumption of cheese in Western Europe to be 35 to 40 pounds per capita. In the United States at 17. 16. California, 25, 26, 27. Got some opportunities there to build that demand beyond where it is. I think there's some good opportunities to get behind and to do that kind of a thing. I don't see, for example, a low fat cheese. Now, that's not an easy thing to do when you're dealing with a product that initially has about 50% fat. But I don't see a low-fat cheese, but yet we see low-fat milk and we see some of these things that are moving with a nutrition-conscious, ever-increasing, nutritious-conscious uh, public. And that's what's happening. And that's what's out there. And we need to capitalize on that. And I have said and will continue to say to the dairy industry, wouldn't it be interesting, wouldn't it be nice to talk in terms of that cow producing 600 pounds of protein rather than 700 pounds of butter fat in our diet conscious United States as we look at competing for that consumer food dollar. Wouldn't it be interesting to talk in those terms and in fact to go into the McDonald's and the Wendy's and those various places and to tell that story in exactly those terms. The protein, the milk, the kind of nutrition that we have and that we're producing. I think there's some opportunities to get behind various kinds of additional new product developments. We haven't had the kind of new product development in the dairy industry that we need to help the farmers and the base producers expand that demand. And then we're coming along with a very confusing thing, and that is the imitation cheese. And again, <clears throat> it's a food product. But I maintain, and I will continue to maintain, that if there isn't a butter fat or if there isn't a milk fat base there, it just ain't cheese. It just to my way of thinking, isn't cheese. And I don't think that we ought to have an amalgamation of labeling in such a way so that we simply have cheese. And we're not sure whether it's the real stuff or it's imitation or what we have. And it's in the interest of the dairy industry and other livestock enterprises to keep that clear in the minds of consumers. We need to get behind and push and promote school lunch and school milk programs. We need to maintain those in helping to expand our demand. And we ought not to let New Zealand make our decisions relative to the selling of our butter and our powder. I think we ought to do that, and I think we have some opportunities to do that. And I spent two weeks in Venezuela, Dominican Republic, and Mexico on a trade mission with some businesses in February of this year. And I saw some unbelievable food shortages. I saw some great opportunities to sell powdered milk. And I think with a very aggressive role, as we look ahead in a hungry world with more purchasing power there now than was there two or three years ago, 
with oil and gas revenues, I think there's some opportunity to move some of those food products. That's one side of the coin. There's some demand opportunities that it seems to me farmers need to be pushing their processors on an international basis, on a marketing and selling advertising basis, new food products, low-fat cheese, labeling on behalf of this industry. We've got too much at stake not to do those kinds of things. <laughs> then I get to the second, the flip the coin, the second part of this. We can do some things there, but that's not going to do it in and of itself. There are certain limits. So what do we do about the supply side? What do we do about what's being produced? As I said, Wisconsin has not been quite as guilty as some other states in increasing milk production in the last two or three years in terms of the amounts. Well, what are their possibilities? We can drop the price and force farmers out. But I have a tough, little bit of a tough time with that, and that always happens to some degree. The poor managers go out and so on. But when we start knocking out some of the individuals who really ought to be our next generation of farmers, I sort of ask the question, what are they going to do and where are they going to go? And what are those opportunities going to be for those individuals and those families? And that's a concern. I think it's a concern to all of us. Well, we can drop the price and force them out. Uh, individual farmers and farm groups and farm organizations can say, hey, let's cull some cows. Let's cut back on this production. There can be some individual kinds of efforts, and some of this has happened. And I think we probably need to have more of that through organizational kinds of efforts, job owning, and those sorts of things. I guess another thing that's going to limit supply to some degree down the pike are some of the barriers that are being erected through the cost of money, the cost of land, and the simple inability to purchase a dairy unit in the next generation. The cost of money, the difficulty of cash flow, it seems to me is going to have an impact on the supply of milk, particularly as those costs don't keep up and aren't, don't stay up with where they should be. And then finally, I guess there's then the option of supply management. Some kind of efforts to say, hey, this is how much we're going to produce. The 126 cranberry growers in Wisconsin do a fairly good job of this. Some of the fruit growers do a fairly good job of this, of saying this is what it's going to be and this is going to be our price. This is our target. Or we take what we have and we figure out how to establish some kind of a price. But I see difficulties in farmers accepting it. I don't see government espousing or doing that kind of a thing today. And so I see some great difficulties when we look at the whole area of supply management. I want to make another observation. And there are some things that, that need to be done from a supply standpoint. But let me make another observation. And I'd want you to think carefully about this. And maybe you won't agree with me on this. And this comes from, I guess, my reading and my travel in the world and what I see happening. I wonder if 1980 may be some kind of a crossroads transition point in our world, where in the 50s and the 60s and the early part of the 70s, we move from what I call, in quotes, a surplus syndrome for food. To the, 18, to the 1980s and the 1990s, where I see the opportunity of a scarcity syndrome for food in the world. And in fact, a great opportunity for those who may have a food reserve or who may, who may be managing food production capabilities or who may be helping determine it, or who may be involved in a breadbasket kind of approach. 
And we're in the biggest breadbasket in the world right here, the 12 Midwestern state area and this country. I see signs of this as I look at Latin America, as I look at the Middle East, as I look at the Far East, as I look at trade missions on a weekly basis going to China, as I see the opening up of a billion people in mouths, for that matter, in the People's Republic of China and the movement within the world, we may be, we may be, as we look down the road, thinking in terms of a scarcity syndrome, people and purchasing power. And that purchasing power is developing. And it's developing faster than most of us think, and I've seen it in some of the areas that I've been in the past couple of years. Now let me conclude by saying, what's the need for bargaining? What's the need for organizing on behalf of farmers? I think it's considerable. It's probably greater now than it ever will be. I see bargaining associations and bargaining attempts through various organizations such as yours, cooperatives, others, doing things in three areas. One, the need to develop some political power. The need to organize, to work together, to build coalitions for political input and political power. What do you call it? Grip? I see those buttons all over. <coughs> yeah, that's what it is. But that's important. You're doing that. And others are doing that on behalf of food and agriculture. And that is important. It's an important role to play. I uh, have a feeling for that after being badgered around by lobbyists and organizations as an agriculture secretary in the state of Wisconsin. <laughs> and I have a little feel for that as a result of uh, being fairly close to USDA policies over the past five to six years and being involved in <clears throat> working with and helping to respond and react to various kinds of things that policy advisors and with the Council of Economic Advisors and the White House and USDA grapple with on a week-to-week -week and a month-to-month -month basis. So yes, there's a need. There's an opportunity. And it's an important one. Secondly, I see a need for organization, for bargaining, on behalf of producers to handle and to deal with and to provide services in the marketplace. Grading, testing of milk, movement of milk, many of the kinds of services in the marketplace that need to be performed and done by someone. And frankly, I think farmers and farmer groups ought to be doing that for themselves more and more and more. Marketing efforts, marketing outreach kinds of programs. And then third, additional discussion on the whole question of what about the amount that we produce and the amount we market? Are we interested in some kind of a supply determination that I as an individual are going to say to this organization, okay, we'll go along with that. And we see certain kinds of things like that. My prediction will be that if farmers get few enough, eventually that'll be fairly easy to do. The interesting question will be, will it be possible to do effectively with the large number of producers, with a lot of differences of opinion and rather individualistic goals and objectives and ideas that you and I know very well exist in the hearts and the minds of farmers in our great country? Those are some of the opportunities. Those are some of the areas. Those are a few thoughts. Those are a few comments. Those are a few ideas. And let me again express my appreciation to NFO, to its national board, to the state operation, to those from Wisconsin 
for a super, super working relationship that we've had in my reign of nearly six years as Agriculture Secretary, and it's just been a month and a half that I left that position and assumed a position as Dean of a College of Agriculture in a major school in Wisconsin training young future agricultural leaders. I hope to help shape their attitudes and their outlooks and their optimism for food and agriculture in this country, in the state of Wisconsin, and I would want to indicate and strongly underline my optimism for agriculture and for the dairy industry in the state of Wisconsin in particular. And I stand ready to help and to assist and to lead and to provide information in any way I can as we project in the decade of the 80s and the 90s. Thank you very much. Thank you.